Um, today we're talking about church. And in the next few weeks, we're talking about our church some more, this church specifically, about what God's been doing and what God is doing now, what God's going to do in, we believe, in the future. In the next three weeks, I just really would challenge you to be here. Um, if I haven't got a chance to meet you yet, my name is Marty, and I serve as the lead pastor here, along with a wonderful, wonderful team of people. And today we're going to talk specifically about why do I need church? Um, I know there have been times where you may have questioned that in the past. And I think the most common answer is you need church now so that when you need a church family, like you really need a church family, they're already there and all those relationships are already developed for you. That's probably the most common thing. We, when things are going good, you feel like you don't need anything or anybody else. Everything's great. Things are good. Got friends and family around you. Everything's wonderful. But um, not everything in life goes smooth sailing your whole life, right? And you really, you really don't realize how much you really need a church family until things are difficult for you. Um, when, when you're locked away, like some of you in, in prison, me, it was just in the hospital during COVID and nobody could get to me. Tammy was at home sick. And some of y'all were sneaking things into the hospital to me. No, it was, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. It was, it was wonderful. I, f I did, I did feel like as if I had been in, if I was in prison, you would still do the same thing. You would like be bringing me a cell phone so I could at least talk to the people on the outside, right? So I know this, that we, we take for granted what we have until we don't have that access to everybody and that thing that we need so much. But together we are the church. If you are a follower of Jesus, you believe in Jesus he says you need to follow him and follow after his will and after his way. And when you do, you are the church. If you remember, we don't even call this building the church. This building is not even a sanctuary. This is a, the 401 building that we use for everything, literally everything. We use all kinds of things in here. It's our community center. And it's not the church. You're the church. You are, we are, we're the church. And so that's what I want to talk to, to today specifically about. Why do I need this family of people that we call church? So the first thing that I want to bring to your attention is that we are, as the church, we are a spiritual family. So uh, some of you like your families. You're like your regular family. You like them. And others of you are like, I was born into the wrong group of people. I'm just, I was born, I was born into this group of people, but I, I mean, I, I, it was, they're, they're all really, really weird. I've heard some of you express thoughts like that. They're all really different and strange, and I'm the only normal one in the bunch. And uh, one of the things about a spiritual family is you get to choose who's in your family. We as a church, we've chosen to be here with each other and um, to become this group of people we refer to as the church. We are a spiritual family. Matthew 16, Matthew 16, verse number 13, Jesus is talking. And in a lot of this passage here, Jesus is explaining what, what this church has started about and how it's going to go. So in, in Matthew 13, 16:13 it says this when Jesus came to a region of Caesarea Philippi he asked his disciples who do people say the son of man is he's talking about Jesus is talking about himself who do people here say that I am and they replied some say you're John the Baptist others say Elijah and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets from the past like from the old testament past come back to life 
is what some of the people are saying. And verse number 15, but what about you? He asked them, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, which was the uh, strong type, type A leader guy, doesn't sound like he was a whole lot of fun, but he was getting things done, right? He's a type A leader. So Simon Peter answered very quickly, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That's who you are. That's what Simon Peter said to Jesus. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but, my, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, or the gates of hell, will not overcome it. Another version says, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm going to build my church. Um, Jesus is saying, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered correctly and says, you're the Messiah. That's who you are. You're God's son. And Jesus had changed Simon Peter's name from Simon to Peter, which means um, a rock, a stone, a pebble, or a, a piece of the rock. The name Rocky really fits his personality. Peter's personality, that's kind of how he was, right? And Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church. Some people think that, that Jesus is talking about Peter being the rock. Uh, others are not, they don't think that. They think about Peter's, the concept of what G Peter has said, that being the rock, the foundation, that Peter said, you're the Messiah. And Jesus is responding by saying, on that, I'm going to build my church. Um, all of it still works really good together. Peter himself said this in 1 Peter 2, 4. He said that Jesus was the chief cornerstone on which the church is built. He's the true cornerstone on which the church would be built. All of those still play into the same line of thinking that God uses people that are just people yeah. to build his group of people that follow him. And he calls that the church. And it takes sometimes Peter type of people that are not the kindest, warm, friendly um, you know, Peter's tough. He's a tough guy. He's like, he wants to hurt people first and pray for them later. You know, that's, that's how he appears. That's how he appears to be. And it takes leadership like that sometimes to build a group of people. And Jesus is saying on this principle and on this person, I'm going to build this great church. And, and no matter what comes our way, hell will not defeat it. Hell will not defeat the church of the living God. So um, we know this. God never intended for us to go through life alone. We are, we are social people. Some of you are more social than others. We try to get you to stop talking like, and just halfway watch the announcement video like, no way, I'm talking through the whole thing. And others of you are like, I will come to church, but please don't nobody, don't anybody touch me or talk to me. It's like, I just, I, if I can get in and out without shaking somebody's hand or hug, being hugged by somebody, that's a win for me. We are, but even when you don't think you need it or don't think you want it, we're still social in the way that we're made up. God made us to be these this people that group together. Um, but oftentimes when you're hurt or depressed or maybe just inclined to want to be alone, people go through times where they will isolate themselves away from the group. And uh, Hebrews 10, 25 references this. And it says this, and 
Hebrews 10, 25. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We're supposed to meet together. We're supposed to encourage each other, especially now that the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's return is closer than it's ever been. So another version of that says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Don't, don't go away from gathering together. Even if you think you need to stay away, even if think you, you don't want this, you need it more than you know. God never intended for us to go through life alone. Actually, throughout the Bible, we see uh, the importance of community, and um, and we see this that that authentic life change happens through relationships from this spiritual family. And you may not know it now, or you may not feel like you need it now. Maybe you do because you're here. And other people that are in your family are not here. They're like, I don't need that. They need it. You know, they need it. You know, they need it, you know? And, um, one of the, one of the sweetest examples of this happened one night at our house at a small group that we were having. We have these things called growth groups through the year where we have small groups of people that meet all over the place. And it's a, um, it, it's just a wonderful time. Things that we can, we get together, we learn together, we pray together. And at one of these small groups one night, this young lady named Amanda was um, uh, pretty far along in her pregnancy and had found out that the baby's uh, intestines were outside of the baby's body. And, and she was quiet, but internally she was freaking out about it. So when it came around time for us to, to uh, after the, the lesson and stuff for us to say, is there anything that we can pray for each other about? Amanda uh, started crying and uh, expressed this. She said, you know, that I've just found out that the baby's intestines are outside of the baby's body. I don't know if it's going to be okay. And she starts crying and she's kind of, well, you know, how, how normal people are, right? You know, like how we do, right? If you're normal, you're like freaking out a little bit, right? And there were... There were three different ladies in this group of, I don't know, 15 or no, no more than 15 people. There were three different ladies that experienced the exact same thing. And they were able to say, hey, don't worry, that happened to my son. Hey, don't worry, that happened with me and my daughter. No, hey, that happened with me and my son. Don't worry about that. The, and God took care of us then, and he's going to take care of you. And she's able to say, you... In, in this group of just a few people. It's not something I even had heard of before. And in this small group of people, God had aligned other people to encourage her. Why? Because God cares about every single one of us and our spiritual growth and development. And it happens best through small relationships like that. They were able to encourage her. We were able to pray for her. And sure enough, her everything was fine with her baby, and she's doing very well. We need each other. We need church because we're better together. We're better together. And we are a spiritual family and uh, a force of nature, too, some, some would say, right? But um, church isn't just a spiritual family. Church is a place for salvation. Part of the reason that we need churches is because of how awkward it is on your workplace to try to lead somebody to the Lord through the prayer of salvation while you're on break at work or at school. It's like, I know there's a thousand other kids in this lunchroom, but let's pray right now for your salvation. You know, it's, 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 it's challenging and it's difficult. So we need places like, like this where we gather together, where we're able to say, hey, if you're here today and you realize you need to 
make things right with God, today's your day. Church is a place where people have an opportunity. Uh, uh, it's an easier setting for them to say, yeah, I, I want to follow that Jesus guy. That's me. You know, it's an easier opportunity, easier place for that. So Romans chapter number 10, verse number 13 says this uh, about who is qualified to get saved. Okay. It says this, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, that's, could you just say the word everyone? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, I know some of you have friends that you don't think it's possible for them to get saved. Whether that's at school, whether that's at, at your workplace, or just people that you live with in your household, or your distant family at least, right? You're like, I don't think the Lord wants them. He, he doesn't. He, they need him real bad. But the scripture is very clear for us that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There was a, a, an old hymn that they wrote about this verse that said, whosoever, in the original uh, King James Version, the verse said, whosoever will. And, and in that old hymn, the writer uh, of the hymn said, whosoever, it's talking about me. That's whosoever means me. And I want you to hear that today. If you're here today and you're, if you feel like you're just not right with God, if you feel like things are just not in the right place, if you were to pass away today, you don't know if you would be in, in, wake up in heaven or wake up in hell. You don't know that today. You don't have to leave with questioning that in your mind. There's assurance for you that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. If you follow him, you will be saved because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. So the verse goes on to say, but how can they call on him uh, to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Church is a place where we tell them. We tell people about Jesus and, and that when we gather together, it's a place where you can find salvation, but it goes beyond salvation. And I could list out, um, honestly, probably really easy, a hundred reasons why I need church. I'm trying to cut this down so that we can get done sometime before two o'clock today. Can somebody say amen? Somebody somewhere say amen. I know you're trying to get ready for back to school and all that. But it goes beyond salvation to it's also the church is a place for like hope. When you're hopeless, it's a place for faith when you're faithless. It's a place for, for us. We all need this gathering together thing that we do. It goes beyond salvation. It also goes to the fact that church is a place for moral and ethical guidance from the Bible. There's a, a, a movement in our world that has been for quite a while to de-emphasize the Bible as God's word, to take away the authority from the Bible to just try to... Uh, try to, to act like there is no authority there, but it is the authority. It's the best-selling book of all times, reproduced more than anything else, any other, and that's for a reason. It is the word of God to us. And from it, we learn and we get moral guidance and ethical guidance from that. So the scripture says this about itself in 2 Timothy uh, 2.15, it says, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. They're talking about the Bible. 
One of the Bibles that I had from when I was a little boy uh, uh, in the front of it, my dad had written the scripture. He had bought the Bible for me, had written the scripture in the front of this Bible. And it, it, was, it was this passage in the older version that said, study to show yourself approved. And I was like, <clears throat> that is not a good start. That is study, study. All I wanted to do growing up was playing sports. I didn't want to study anything. The only studying I ever wanted to do was to study enough to pass enough to play sports. That's all it, all it was when I was a kid. But the scripture encourages us, like my dad wrote that passage in my Bible, I've never forgotten, that if we study this and we know this, we're not ashamed because we're, we're, we're rightly dividing God's word, which is truth to us. We need it. So we need it not just for our, uh, you know, not just, not just for our own ethical and moral guidance, but also for the ethics and moral guidance for younger ones. It says in, in Proverbs 22, 6, direct your, child, direct your children onto the right path. And when they're old, they will not leave it. The King James Version, you know, raise up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. The things that the teachers are being asked to communicate in schools today are crazy. The things that, that are being put online and uh, question, questions being raised are just are just crazy. Um, and I, I don't want to get off of the subject of the church and talk about the different things that are being uh, raised, but I will tell you this, that we live in a world that tries to teach people that um, they need to live up to their own truth and find their own truth. There is no truth separate from the word of God. It is the basis of truth. So, and, and where do people learn the word of God? Where do they learn what is moral and ethically correct? They learn it when we come together to do church. That's where, that's where it's, it's taught that lying is absolutely wrong all of the time. Even if you're in a tough situation, and you think it's just a little white lie. There are no little white lies. They're always black. I'm going to go over here and talk to this group of people. There's, there's, there's nothing that we can do to, to justify sin, all sin. Black, wrong. It's wrong. And, and yet, our kids are being taught through school and through social media. I don't believe it's through the teachers. I believe it's, it's through an agenda that's pushed on the teachers. And there are a few of them that are bad and crazy, but not the majority of them are just trying to do a good job. And uh, there's things that are pushed on them to talk about and to not talk about. And honestly... Um, there is no truth away from God's word. You can't, you just, you can't make up your own truth. Uh, I heard a guy talking the other day about uh, the fact that they absolutely wanted to have uh, ladies in high positions in government, a woman, uh, women in high positions in government but then they refused at the same time to actually define what a woman is. We can't tell you what a woman is, but we want a woman in leadership positions in government. It's like, that's, that's the kind of stuff that's pushed more and more and more and more and more and more as culture goes along and people try to make up their own 
truth to act like there's nothing wrong with the way that they feel or their own actions because it is their truth. It may be their truth until it crosses over into your truth. Uh, a person may be attracted to children. Let me put it that way. And they think they're okay to be attracted to children until it's my child they're attracted to or one of your children that are also my children that they're attracted to. And um, you should say amen at that point. Because just because they're trying to work on their truth doesn't mean it gives them right or responsibility to be able to move over onto what I know to be true. And my truth isn't based on my opinion. It's based on the word of God. That's, that's what we refer to in church as doctrine. We have to come back to our beliefs are, are based on the Bible, not just on what we like. What we like is called preferences. Our, our beliefs are based on the word of God. So, for us, we need to understand that church is a place for moral and ethical guidance. And we get that from straight from the Bible. Straight from the Bible. So the last thing I want to mention to you today, we, do, we don't just get together to, to talk about and work on things that are um, our moral and ethical guidelines for us from the Bible. It's not just a place we get together to express and give people an opportunity to get saved. It's not just a spiritual family, but church is a place for worship and prayer. Jesus said it very clearly, my house will be called a house of prayer. And um, I believe that every one of us need to worship something outside of ourselves. We get so used to taking care of ourselves that we put ourselves in the, the throne room of our own life as if we are the God of our life and we need to serve a real God, not just ourselves. Because I don't know uh, what magic you've made happen lately, but you are not God. We're not. I'm not. I'm not God. I didn't make it all. I didn't cause all this mess. God made the world. He put it into order. He can control it. He can fix it. He made it. And I'm just glad to be on his team. I'm not working against him. I'm working with him. Matthew um, 18, verse number 19, Matthew 18, 19, says this. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with them. It's a place when we gather together, wherever it is, it's a place for worship. It's a place for, for prayer. You might have heard us mention that on our mission trip in Ecuador, there was a family that was praying for a baby. They, they were talking to Pastor Tim, the missionary there, about the fact that the baby had had fever and wasn't eating, and they were, of course, they're in the jungle. There's not a doctor. There's not a nurse. There's nobody close by. And um, and so I went over to, to see what was going on with Tim, and he's talking to this family. And he tells me what's happening, and you could see sweat on the baby. You could see the baby sweating. It was hot, but it wasn't that hot, right? But the baby had obviously had fever, was sweating, her hair, her little hair was wet, and um, Pastor Tim and I played, placed hands on the baby, and we just prayed that 
that God would do what he does. He's a loving and he's a compassionate God. And the scripture says where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there. And if they ask for something, I'll, I'll do that. If it's in accordance with God's will, he'll, he'll do that. So we laid our hands on the baby and we, we prayed. And Pastor Tim just stayed there and kept talking to the family. And he kept checking the baby's temperature. He kept putting his hand back on the baby's head to see if the fever had gone away. And uh, after just a few min after just a few minutes, you could noticeably see the baby wasn't sweating anymore. And the fever had broke, and he, he felt of the baby and said to the mom, it feels like the fever is broke. And, um, and she was able to, mom felt of the baby, and sure enough, the fever was broke. And a few minutes later, the baby wakes up and is ready to eat, which is a really good sign, you know, good sign for the family, because we're two or three are gathered together. Now, let me ask you, does it have to just be a building like this? Does it? No. Does God care about buildings? God's most interested in you. The only reason that God would want this building would be more of you. To give you opportunity and your friends an opportunity for us to have a place to come together because you don't like how hot it is outside right now. I'm fine with it. But you're like, it's miserable. It's miserable. And when I preach and it's super hot like that outside, you just want to leave. You know, not like in here. It's cool and comfortable. And you're like, I'll stay forever. Yeah, thank you for that. Both, both of you. Thank you, both of you. All two of you felt that way. There have been many times that I've seen uh, people feel like they hang around church, but they feel like they don't really need it until they need it. You, I'm, you need to understand you need relationship with these people around you. Whether or not you realize you need relationship with these people around you, you need relationship with these people around you. Because there are, as the scripture says, there are troubling times coming for all of us. It says, in this life, we will have trouble. So for those of you that are new to this whole thing, and you think if you are a follower of Jesus, all troubles you're exempt from, uh, you, you don't understand. As long as you're in this life, you're going to have troubles. You're going to have heartaches. You're going to have hardships. Troubles refine us and help us. But just like Amanda experienced in that, in that small group in our living room, when there were three other ladies that experienced the same kind of difficulty she was having with the baby, just like she realized that day is that God presets up for us relationships. He makes them happen for us. We just need to keep showing up. We keep showing up and God puts these relationships there for us. And when we need them, they're there. They're there to talk to us, to encourage us. And to, yeah, to love and, and help us to grow in hope and grow in faith. God directs us that way, directs our lives that way. So we need each other because we're a spiritual family. We need each other because, because together is where we find salvation and where we help others find salvation. Let me remind you that heaven and hell are real. And salvation isn't because we're trying to help people just have a better life here. It's because we're trying to steal souls out of hell and help people have heaven to look forward to forever. That's what salvation is about. But it goes beyond salvation. It goes beyond hope and faith. It goes beyond that all the way into helping us to learn what is morally and ethically 
correct and what is right to do and what is not right to do. And it goes into the fact that this is a place where we come together to worship a God that is far greater than we are. Church, I dream about this place being filled with people who will worship God. Excuse me for a second so I can get a drink and I can keep preaching. I would like for you to realize that no matter how you feel, God deserves to be worshiped. No matter how you feel. There was a time period when in my life, I was raised going to church and raised going to Christian school. And uh, I won't put this on everybody, but I'll say this for myself, having been raised in church and Christian school, that what came natural to me was judgment. Not from the church, but for each other. I felt internally very judgy. Anybody, you don't have to admit that you judged me a lot this morning already, but you understand what I'm talking about, right? About other people, not you, about other people being judgy, right? And I remember looking over one time at one of my friends during a chapel service during, in Christian school, and the worship service was happening. And one of my friends that I knew to be a very bad person, I knew this. I mean, I knew, I knew details. I should not have known details about this other dude that was bad. And he's raising his hands in worship. <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness, what, what a fraud. Why? He's like, who is he trying to fool? And I, hold the, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me down in here. Maybe he speaks kind and gentle to you. He typically speaks rougher, more forceful to me and kind of a condemning tone, just to be honest, right? He's, he, said, he said, maybe the same God that forgives you has forgiven him. I felt sucker punched, right? It's... It's not for anybody else's benefit that I raised my hands. Unashamedly raised my hands. You, you need to understand when you worship the Lord like this, it's, you're not doing this because you look holy. You look like somebody just scored. That's what you look like. Someone somewhere just scored. And you're going, yeah, we won. Or we're winning. We don't do this. We don't do the things that we do. We bow down, kneel down, come forward for prayer. We don't do those things to look to anybody else to be holy or righteous or anything else. So if you're judging other people in the room, stop it. Maybe the same God that forgives you of your unrighteousness, your sin, for, has already forgiven them of theirs. So... I dream of our church being a church that worships, that worships like this and excitedly worshiping God. Not, not worshiping or not going through a worship service like we already lost. What are you guys doing? Sometimes when we're up here and we're leading worship or whatever and we look out and we see some of you, it's like you've already decided your team is lost, but I have no idea why you've come to the game. God, God doesn't want us to worship that way. Uh, he wants us to worship him, he says, in spirit and in truth. What is the truth? He's the savior of all mankind. Upon him, the church is going to be built, not upon us. It's not about you. It's not about you. 
And part of the reason why I raise my hand in worship is to remind myself that I am not the king of my own universe. He is. That's part of why I raise my hands. I bow my knee. I lift my head or I bow my head to him and surrender in worship. He deserves it. And I, it's best for me if I do that. And it's best for you if you get off the throne of your own life. And if your whole world doesn't revolve around you making it happen, because there's a lot of stuff that we just can't fix. We just can't. And we need him and we need us. I need you. We need each other. We need this together. We need to be reminded. And sometimes some of you will worship and it's so encouraging, like whatever you had going on during the week and you worship God like with a reckless abandon, it is awesome. And it's encouraging to, to others. We need each other. We need to worship. We need to pray. Why do we pray? Because God hears and he answers prayer according to his will. That's what his word says. We are gathered together and he hears us and he answers prayers. And he does, listen, miracles. We're not asking God to do something that we can do. God, I really need, you know, really need this to happen. I need somebody to pack up that backpack for back to school tomorrow. But you're not asking God to do things that you can do. It's like God, supernaturally, we need protection around our students. I can't be there. I would be there with some type of machine gun if I could. I'm not typically a helicopter grandparent, but I can be. I believe that God can take care of us, you and our children and our grandchildren, better than we can take care of them. We need the miraculous hand of God. We need God, so we pray and we believe God, not for the natural, but for the super, super natural. And God hears and answers prayer. So that's why I believe, that's why I believe we all need church. We all need it. So we're a spiritual family. We need a place where we can be saved. We need a place where we can grow and develop the, the morals and ethics that we learn from God's word. And we need a place where we can worship and where we can pray. That's why we come together. And I want to ask you to stand with me together today. We want to do just that. We want to worship and we want to pray. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come across the front. In just a few minutes, our students are going to be coming over from Kids Church and we're going to pray for them. We're going to surround them and we're going to pray and we're going to believe supernaturally that God is going to protect them because we live in a crazy world full of crazy people. And for those of you that are, you consider yourself to be crazy, thanks for coming today. This is a place, this is the right place for you. We're going to pray in just a few minutes for them. But before we do that, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes with me across this place today. I realize that there may be some people here today that don't feel like things are right between them and God. And you need to know you've come to the right place today. This is a place for salvation. This is a place for restoration. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed today. Just, just, just me looking around, just me. If you feel like you need to make things right with God, would you slip up your hand right where you're at today? Thanks, thanks. That's me, that's me, that's me. I want to make things right with God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to make sure things are right between me and God. Thank you. Anybody else, you haven't raised your hand yet, but you want to, you, thank you. Hands are raised from the front to the back, from the side to the side. You're not the only one because this is a place of salvation. This is a place of healing and restoration. You're, you are safe here. We're not here to embarrass you. I just want to pray with you and lead you to a right place with God. Anybody else today? 
say, that's me, Pastor. I need to make sure things are right between me and God. Thanks. Thanks. I want to make sure things are right between me and God. Thanks. Thanks. Would you say this prayer with me all over this place today? Say, Jesus, I'm sorry for all of the wrong things that I've done. God, I need you to come into my life to clean me up. God, I thank you for hearing my prayer and for forgiving my son, my sin. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, maybe you prayed that prayer for the first time.